hello. Welcome to Unity of East Louisville podcast. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. The purpose of this podcast is twofold. It will give people considering visiting our community the opportunity to get to know us through our members. And the podcast gives our members the opportunity to learn more about each other. We're here today with Reverend Carol Mahaffey. Um, Reverend Carol is the founding Minister of Unity of East Louisville. How are you today, Carol? I'm doing great. How about you, Suzanne? So I good to be with glad. you. Great to be with you, too. It's been a long time. It had too long. Way too yes. long. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. So, um, you know, I had I had the little bio written up and then I thought, well, let's just let her tell it. So let's start. Let's start from the beginning. You have some very interesting information in the beginning of your bio. You were in a convent from the ages uh, 14 to 18. Can you tell us about that? I was. <laughs> I would have gone in at age 13 had my mother given permission, but my mother would not give permission. And by the way, I just found out that I went to the same grade school as um, Sandra Higgins Smith. We were writing each other last night and, and St. Rita was our school and that's where I met the nun who sponsored me to go into the convent. So when I graduated from St. Rita, which is also where Sandra graduated from, um, my mother would not give permission for me to go in at age 13. So I had to wait a year and I bugged her just the entire year. And so finally she let me enter. <laughs> wow. So what, what did it mean? This, so this was in the late 50s. What did it mean to enter a convent at 14, were you training to become a nun? What was Yes, it? yes. Okay. You, uh, you do, uh, you're a postulant until you become a novitiate. And I was a postulant and I wore the short habit with the black hose and shoes and black habit and the veil and um, all of that. And then um, I, if had I stayed past age 18 that summer, I would have become a novice gone into the novitiate and taken my temporary vows. So um, I was, it was like a preparation for, but I lived in the convent with all the other nuns and, and went through everything all the other nuns did, including my favorite thing of getting up at four in the morning and going to chapel for <laughs> meditation. <laughs> wow. So I have two questions. Um, so what was this about? The first question is you were a religious child, I guess, a religious teenager. And um, why did you decide not to go that route when you were 18? Well, you know, you have asked a very interesting question. And the answer I'm going to give you, some people may think it's hokey. But this is exactly what happened to me. My parents, my mother, not my dad so much, he had already moved to California. But my mother got to the point where she was very proud that I was in the convent. And so when I called her to tell her I was coming home, she didn't want to come after me. <laughs> My stepdad got on the phone and he said, we'll come Carol. I'm like, thank you. But um, I woke up one day and was, I think in my cubicle, we had a cubicle where we had a bed that was just a mattress on a flat surface. And we had like a pitcher of water we washed our face with. And um, we did that in the morning as a ritual. So anyway, I'd gotten up and splashed my face. And it was if I heard an audible voice that said, and my first, my name came first, Carol. This was just a, a thought. It was a very powerful thought. It said, it's time for you to go home. And I'm like, oh, no, I love it here. I don't want to go home. <laughs> so I went to Mother Superior. She said, that's the devil. You need to say um, uh, what's called a rosary novena, and you Catholics out there will understand this. And I did say the rosary novena, and the voice and the thought, I, I call it a voice, but the thought just got even stronger. And it just so was starting to interfere with everything, my schooling and everything. So I went back to her, and so she told me to pack my bags, and um, I left. And it, it, now I realize it was not, this is what's so ironic about it. It was not the voice of the devil. It was the voice of the Holy Spirit telling me to go home because I had yet to come and be married and bring and make it 
so that two children could come into this world through me. I'll always believe that's part of why I left, but I also believe that the work that I'm doing now was the other reason why I was urged to leave. I had the spiritual foundation that I needed to jumpstart me in whatever spiritual work I'd be doing in the future. So that was definitely God speaking to me. And God always calls me by my first name when it's something really important. When I was uh, guided to leave Unity of Fort Wayne, Unity Christ Church of Fort Wayne, my first church that I took, I got up and the board and I had been on a retreat and I was looking out my kitchen window and it here is this God voice again in my head saying, Carol, it's time for you to leave. And I didn't want to leave there either, <laughs> but wow. I did, but I did. And I realized that it did come to me <clears throat> that same day that the seed that I planted was for somebody else to harvest up there, not for me. So I, I listened. And so now what I realized many years later, Suzanne, and this is what's so, it's, it's just so fascinating to me about how God works. My mother had been estranged from my sister for a long, many, many years. And my sister lived in Louisville. So when I left Fort Wayne, I got the invitation to serve at Unity of Louisville. And my mom was living with me. So I took her with me. And do you know that the last two years of her life, she and my sister reunited and had the best relationship ever before she died. She died two years later. And I, re I just knew it after she died that that was the reason I was to leave Fort Wayne, go to Louisville and take her so she and my sister could reunite. Wow, that's beautiful. And thank God you are someone clearly from a young age who listens to that voice because Absolutely. a lot of us might just be like, well, I'm happy. This is what I'm going to do. I don't know yeah. what that is. So let me yeah. just do what I want to do. But you, you, it was another call and you listened. It absolutely was. It was not well received. I will say that by the church um, at the time that I was there at Fort Wayne, because we were all happy together. But I, I tried to explain to them that I was a child of God and that when I heard my name being called and they had no way of knowing that that same thing had happened to me to leave the convent, they had no way of knowing that, but I, I knew that. And I guess maybe I should have shared more with them about it, but I myself did not know why God was leading me to leave. I really didn't at the time. So anyway. well, that faith and trust is inspiring. It, it's something that, you know, I will take with me to the next life and beyond because it was so impactful. It was so incredible and it was so life changing. So yeah. beautiful. So Thank can you, you can you tell us a bit about your uh, pre ministerial life once you left the convent? So this is leaving the convent to before you found unity, those intervening years. Yeah, well, <clears throat> um. It really was difficult because um, when I got married, I was not married in the Catholic Church and I was excommunicated as a result. And as a result of that, I ended up really kind of thing. I mean, I tried out the Episcopalian Church and that didn't work. And I think maybe even Presbyterian or something, you know, and it just none of it worked. And um so I was, I drifted for decades and decades. I mean, I wasn't, I, I went to mass at the Catholic church, even though I was excommunicated, but I felt a drift and I felt, mm, what's the word I can say, just out of sync with everything, you know, and that was for a very long time. And when the girl's father and I divorced, I have two children, two girls. Um, it was like, it was just really interesting how it all happened. And that's a whole nother Zoom call, okay? <laughs> About how a friend of mine introduced me to Unity. But she told me to buy the book, Unity, Dynamic Laws of Prosperity by Unity Minister Catherine Ponder. And I did. And Suzanne, it, it absolutely changed my life. So <laughs> I started Unity Study Prayer and Study Group in Paducah, Kentucky for two years before I went off to ministerial school. 
And the same thing happened with my group. I mean, we were so happy. And then it was like, I knew that I had to have more. I knew I had to do more and learn more and more and more about unity because it was changing my life. And so I told the group, I said, I think I want to go to ministerial school. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, oh, they wanted me to go, but they didn't want me to leave. So, and you know, then, you know, the rest of the story is Paul Harvey used to say, but um, you have all these examples where you had to leave your good for the greater good. And you didn't even know what that greater good was going to look like, but you, you trusted and you had faith that you were going where you needed to go. Very inspiring. Absolutely, Suzanne. You just nailed it. <laughs> that would be hard for me if I were well, you know, just happy. To just, yeah, <laughs> I'd have a hard time with that. <laughs> because, I, because I was happy. I was happy when I was in the convent. I was happy when I was at Fort Wayne. And I was happy in Paducah doing my prayer group thing. So you're right. You're exactly right. And it's tough. Wow. But. But my happiness was not as strong as the inner call that I was getting. And I guess that's what made the difference. Okay, I, I see. Yeah. So, um, so tell us about Unity Ministerial School. I, um, how is it similar or different from um, standard Protestant seminaries, like uh, other denominations? Do you, oh. you know? Do you have a sense of that? I know you've only been to Unity, but. Yeah, well, Unity is definitely experiential. They went through a period where they tried to be, uh, what's the word I want? They tried to be, uh, you could get a bona fide degree. They tried that and it was so expensive and they didn't have enough people to teach it. And the requirements for their professors were so strict that they finally gave it up. I was really hoping that Unity would be a seminary where you could go to get a bona fide degree, you know, but it's an experiential school. And at the time I went, it's so different now, gosh, Uh, the time I went, and we're talking over 20 years ago, because I was ordained in 97. uh, You went for two years, and you had June off, and you had um, a good part of December off. And, you know, for holidays and stuff and vacation. But it was like $2,000 for the year. (laughs) Now it's like, somebody told me that it was like $50,000 or something insane. I don't, I don't know. I could not have afforded to go had it, you know, been that way. Because I had to, I had to literally um, store everything, sell my house and sell my business. I was in business at the time I entered ministerial school, so I sold my business in in part to have money to go to ministerial school, so, and then she couldn't pay me my second year of ministerial school. (laughs) She she said her, her company just didn't have the money, and so I went to work as an RN, which I was when I entered ministerial school. I went to work as an RN in downtown Kansas City, Missouri as a um, RN consultant and mm-hmm. you know what's I mean I just have so I, I need to my, everybody tells my mother told me you need to write a book um, I was at 12th and Main Street in Kansas City Missouri down there at the Department of Labor where I worked as an RN consultant and it was it was at the time that Timothy McVeigh had committed his crime of blowing up that federal building so I went into work behind bulletproof glass Oh, wow. Yeah, because we dealt with people who who were on workers comp and federal comp and things like that. So it was really kind of scary, but um, it was interesting. (laughs) I had so many interesting experiences there. Um, I don't know how much time you have, but I won't take up too much of your time. But I had some fascinating. I had a great healing experience while I was in ministerial school. Um, I, why don't you go I, to share? Why don't you go ahead and share that? Because we know Unity people are all about healing, so I think they would like to hear that, probably. Okay. Well, um, I I had been told all my life that I had a prolapsed mitral valve in my heart, and it's called Barlow syndrome. If you want to look it up, um, and um, I would get palpitations, and I would get heart skip a beat, you know, and I would get hypo, I would get hyper. Um, what do you call it? Tachycardia, you know, things like your heart beating real fast, stuff like that. 
And that's why I had, to, and I always had to have antibiotics when I went to the dentist, you know, things like that. So, because that particular bacteria in your mouth attacks the chambers of the heart. So I used to always have to do that. So I was starting with tachycardia and some other things. And um, I decided to go see a cardiologist because I'd always had a cardiologist since I was a young kid. And um, <clears throat> so I told my ministerial class, of which there were about 25 of us, I said, you know, I'm going tomorrow to see the cardiologist. I want you all to pray with me. So we all, oh my gosh, I could tell you about so many other miracles, but <laughs> we all got in a circle. And they, 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 I got in the middle of the circle and they got around me and prayed for me. So I went off to my appointment. Now, I had never met this cardiologist out in Kansas City, of course, because I lived in Kentucky. So he came back in the room after they did an echocardiogram and um, he had examined me and talked to me and taken my vital signs and all that. He said, who told you you had prolapse mitral valve? <laughs> wow. And I said... I said, oh my gosh, well, I've had prolapse mitral valve since I was about six years old. And, what was, you, and you were treated by various doctors saying the same thing? All cardiologists. All your life? All wow. cardiologists, yes. And I had a cardiologist up in, in Paducah, Kentucky, up until the time I left to go to ministerial school. So I looked at him and I said, what are you saying? He said, I'm telling you, you don't have it. Your heart is perfectly normal. I mean, I about fell out of the chair. <laughs> I mean, Suzanne, wow. these are the kinds of things that happen uh, when you believe and when you pray together and you hold the vision. That's the kind of thing that happened with the founding of Unity of East Louisville. I'm telling you, there were so many of us who so believed and were so strong in that belief. It's the same. I It's. I can't even hardly put it into words, but it's the same feeling inside that you have, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. I mean, it's amazing how God works in our lives. It's totally, totally amazing. So Right. Well, you know, in, in, in the Bible, Jesus says things like all of this you, you will do and more, you know, that. Absolutely. He did. So, yeah. So, and, and. I've, since I was little and, and read the Bible, read that in the, I was always very curious about that. Like, like you said, unity is experiential and that's why I love it. So yeah. I asked, well, what exactly does that mean? We can do all this and more. And it sounds like you explored some of that more in mysterious ministerial school with other people. Oh, I think it really had so much to do with Myrtle talking about all the time. Myrtle Fillmore, she helps me from the other side, believe me. She talks so much about not so much raising money, but raising consciousness. And she's so right on because it's all about the consciousness raising that you do in healing, whether it's your bank account or your body or your relationship. It, it really doesn't matter. It's just about this consciousness, you know? It's just pretty fascinating to me. It really, really is. Yeah. So, and, and those who are maybe new to Unity or not in Unity, but are listening to this, Myrtle Fillmore is the co-founder of uh, the Unity denomination. Yes. Oh, um, you know, and I was telling you about how I worked downtown at 12th and Main. I had to pass some major department stores when I walked from where I parked to where I went to work. And it was several blocks, you know, I forget how many city blocks, but it was a few. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And I stopped at this one department store and there was this gorgeous lace dress. And because I so believe in the power of divine imagination, which is one of our 12 powers we teach in unity, because I so believe in the power of faith, which is another power we teach in unity. So I said to myself, go get that dress and put it. And I hung that dress on my closet, on the outside of my closet door at the apartment that I rented while I was in school. And I pictured myself a zillion times giving the speech, giving the talk when we graduated and walking across that stage. And I want you to know that's exactly what happened. Even though, the, even though one of our professors came in that morning and said they had elected Alan Moss to give the talk and my table mate, David, he's, he's, 
he's got his angel wings now. But David looked at me and he said, what's wrong, Carol? And this big tear uh-huh. came down my face. And I said, <laughs> I think about it today. I said, I want so much to give that talk. He said, well, you still can. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you still can because they're talking about the graduation talk, but you can give the ordination talk because we students vote for that. They voted for me and I get the ordination talk. Oh, wow. So when you saw that dress, are you saying that like you had a visual flash of yourself oh, doing oh, it? Oh, yeah, I kind of got sidetracked. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. okay. I hung that dress on the outside of my closet and I wore that dress when I gave that talk on ordinate, when we were ordained, we were, we graduated and ordained the same day. One was in the morning, one was later in the day, (laughs) excuse me. So it was a Victorian lace dress. And after I gave my talk, we went outside and we were all, you know, talking and excited. And oh my God, it was such an exciting day. And they all said, they all got around me and they said, Carol, have you seen that picture? Myrtle Fillmore has got a dress exactly like yours. <laughs> and they, yeah, I went home and looked up the book. It's called 100 Years of Vision. And there she sits with her arms on a wicker chair, wicker, wicker rocking chair <laughs> with that dress on. And her birthday is the same as mine. So, and her daughter, she's named Caroline. Her her middle name is Caroline. Her real name is Mary Caroline Page was her name. And my daughter's name is Caroline. So I have a lot of connections with Myrtle Fillmore. She has helped, she helped me found the church there. Um, She's been with me every step of the way. That's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. So, um, you had alluded to some of the uh, synchronicities and, and, and we like to use the term miracles in um, unity for yeah. um, another word for synchronicity or when things come together. Oh, I call, them divine, sort of, I call them divine synchronicities. That's yeah. Or kismet. When, they, when it just, when just, everything seems to align, we, we like mm. the word miracle. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and you gave, and I love it because you gave me like a timeline of them. So, I, I can always just refer back here if I have a question. Um, sure, sure. So Boy, there, there was one after another when we when we started to try to find our church home. There was just one after another. So you began the search in 2002. So I didn't come until 2005. So this will be interesting for me to hear. Um you uh, met with the city of Middletown to discuss the, uh, us renting the building there. Um, it was the, the part of the city building. Right. Um, and then yeah, so the, 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 you opened on August 21st. Yes. And we were there seven years. So this is getting, yes. getting to when I was there. Um, I, I, I went into the, I went, we were having a board meeting one Sunday after seven years and I was doing church in a trunk and they would rent the church out and we'd come in and the toilets would be stopped up and the bathrooms would be dirty or, the, or there'd be trash all over the sanctuary or, you know, it'd be something that we'd have to deal with whenever the city rented it out for weddings and it was a beautiful church. So they rented it out for weddings and all kinds of stuff. And after about seven years of that, I was so tired. I had to put everything. We didn't have any storage. So I had to put everything in my trunk and drag it out. And I just went in one day and I said, guys, I, I, I love you all, but I can't do this anymore. After seven years of doing this, I, I just can't. And so this one person who got off the board pretty quick said, well, what do you propose we do? And I said, I propose we find our own place <laughs> that we buy, that we buy our own building. And this person said, have you looked at the bank account? <laughs> and we had about 25,000 in there. And I said, yes, I have. I realize it's not much in there, but I believe. So this person ultimately left and you know it was a blessing in disguise that this person left and got off the board because after that we were off and sailing high into the ethers with our divine imaginations and our faith and everything that we would have our own place and let's let's get into that divine imagination a bit because can you tell us about the affirmation process that we did for it was a couple years wasn't it carol 
to uh, um, to uh, attract our right and perfect church home. That well, I think ours. we purchased it in 2009. If I'm, you know, I may right. not be always correct and everything, but I'm pretty sure that I'm right on that. Um, yeah, we purchased it in 2009. So, um, you know, it, it really didn't take all that long, really, from the time we started visioning. And what happened was, this is what happened. Like I told you, it started with that board meeting and I said, it has to change. So the board started visioning first, of course, that, you know, that happens. And then we get ready to take it to the congregation, you know, what we're thinking of doing. So, excuse me, just one moment. Okay, so um, Sonny Gulati, did I talk to you about Sonny? I think yeah. He, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, he's well, still Sonny, a member. I'm pretty sure he was visiting out in California, but I thought he said our church. So I thought he lived out there. So I could be wrong, and I apologize if I'm wrong about that. But Sonny came to church, uh, to our church on Main Street one day and said, uh, and I had mentioned to the congregation, you know, let's start visioning. And so we... It, the word was getting around this is what we wanted to do and Sonny came in and he said well you know we did that at our church and he said we said an affirmation every Sunday and the minister uh composed the affirmation and I said well Sonny can you get that affirmation to me and I'm pretty sure he did now I'm not sure that the one that I gave you and shared with you is the one that he gave to us but it, it's a it's a semblance of it anyway it's all the same intent you know so what we started to do as a result of Sunny's suggestion was we started saying it aloud every Sunday morning that we met on Main Street all of us together at the same yes. time yes hold, holding that vision and here is yes. the affirmation that we used so it was with God as our source faith as our foundation and the Christ as our guide, we join in harmony with spirit in realizing our right and perfect church home. Thank you, God. That's it. That's it. It worked. <laughs> it, it worked because, because that is 25,000 in the bank. And, and here we are 20 <laughs> plus years later. We're still there. Still doing well. <laughs> oh, well, it was ordained by God. It was meant to be. And I'm I am so honored that I was a part of it. I'm so honored. I know there's a lot of people who are no longer there that were part of this, you know, but that's okay. You know, um, I think Unity Churches are very progressive and they have a tendency to change congregations ever so often. You know, that's what I'm hearing or what I've heard almost all my ministerial life about Unity Churches, but um, I'm so honored to have been a part of it. I really am. And I just thank God for all the miracles that happened, the miracle of Betsy Nectar, the miracle of um, Jean Holloway, the miracle of Colette coming up and telling me about that, that property for sale, the miracle of Kathy Jennings, who was our real estate agent. Oh, my gosh, she had us go out underneath a tree and everybody got a rock and we blessed the grounds and we took a rock home and we prayed over that was a symbol of where, you know, our church, this was from our church home and this is where we were going to be. Oh my gosh. It was all so exciting. <laughs> and then, uh, Su uh, not Susan. Uh, yeah, Susan. Um, oh gosh, her name escapes. It's Susan Williams, right. the attorney, mm -hmm. she dedicated her, all her, uh, uh, legal expertise and, and represented us during the sale or the purchase rather in the set in course the sale too. But it was all just, it just all went, you know, how have you ever had anything you've done in life where when you set the intent and you started in on it and you took that first step, you did, you put it into action, that things went chink, 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 yes. chink. That's how it was. And I, it's also was. happened the other way when I've tried to do things and it was just forcing and couldn't get it to work. I so know. the yeah. binary comparison of having both experiences yeah. tells me that the one way is more simpatico with um spirit than yeah. the other one yeah. the other is simpatico yes. with i guess maybe my my yeah. ego drives or whatever it is you know on a given day but yeah so you start to really recognize the patterns of how I it almost, expresses. i almost wonder if uh we want to do things where we have to push and shove and manipulate I almost wonder, I've never really done a study per se, but I almost wonder if it really 
has if it really affects how lasting the result is you know obviously the result of what we did back in 2009 was lasting even though congregants came and went it's lasting it's still there you're still a part of it it's still there and of course, I'll always be a part of it my whole life and into the next. It's your legacy. It's your legacy. That's why we want to have you be the first interview on our podcast series, because you were the founder. Oh, and it's, thank it's, you. It's part of your legacy in life. Well, you know, I, I really could not have done it at all without the help of all these earth angels. And that's what I think I put in my little summary that I wrote for you. All these earth angels that showed up. I could not have done it if it hadn't been for them. And so I, I appreciate, you know, I had the impetus and I know that I was in my divine right place when I did start all of it, but I jump started it. But then on the other hand, so many and still so many keeping it going and all that. So I was a part of it. Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. It's beautiful. So mm -hmm. let's see where we are on our timeline <laughs> now. Um, well, I think um, I may have mentioned most everything. Oh, what, one thing that I think is interesting, uh, we had our fundraising program um, because after we moved, it was obvious that we needed to raise funds to help reduce the balance and all of that, you know, to get us going. And uh, there was a minister in Nashville, Tennessee by the name of Reverend Cherie Larkin. I think she's retired from ministry now. I know she's not at that church anymore in Nashville, at the big church in Nashville, but I had met her. She was a certified financial planner and she had developed for Unity a program for churches to raise funds. Now, you know, you'd have people, and this, this is one of the things that's challenging for a minister. You have people coming up to you and saying, well, let's let's have a, a, a bake sale. Well, let's have a car wash. Well, let's have. <laughs> and what you learn really that I learned really quickly, those things are friend raising, but they're not fundraising. <laughs> and this is something that Sherry taught all of us that took this, you know, introductory class um, that she had about her program. You can raise friends, but when it comes to raising capital, it's a different ball game. So her program was geared towards actually raising capital, and that's what we did. And I, to this day, can't tell you how much we raised. I'm embarrassed to say, um, and I don't know why that escapes me because the other um, numbers really don't. But that one kind of escapes me. And I think that was a few years when I I, I wasn't there. Uh, this, my son was having some health issues. So, yeah, I, I, I don't remember either. But yes, I know that it, was. Did. it was. Yeah, you it was called raise. God's Promise. Remember yeah. that? God's yeah. Promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you and, tell me about some of the suggestions that she made? You know, instead of the car washes or the, the, uh, the oh, big sales or that um, sort, well, of, it, sort it, of in kind it, things. Yeah, it, it is basically a pledge program. It's it's a uh, intentional giving program is what people are calling pledges now. I understand, you know, it wasn't called that back then, but people are calling it uh, back then called it pledges. So what you do, you start out by having groups meet in, in the homes and you get a group of people to agree to meet in their homes and um, they pray together. They set the intention together. Um, they do all kinds of things to create, um, create a bond about what was going to happen, you know, and uh, so we, we call them sacred circles. So we had sacred circles meeting. Uh, then we had, um, then we had a video, I think Susan Williams was one of the people that was on the video, and I forget who all was on the video, asking for people to make pledges and the reason why they were asking, you know. And so that sort of thing. So it was very intentional and very focused on. And then we had a goal. And I think there for a while we had a either a thermometer or something out the front of when you came in the hallway there, um, the front door there, right again on that wall that faced the front door. There was like a, um, a gauge of where we were in, in our fundraising. So you had that. Um, gosh, I can't think of some of the other stuff but but it was really then of course at the end of it we had a huge celebration and and remember Joanne Palmieri yes 
Oh, she lived over in a skyscraper off Brownsboro Road. <laughs> I don't know if you were able to make it to that or not, but it was a huge celebration in their community room there. And uh, we announced how much money was brought in and all that. So it was really a wonderful time of camaraderie, spiritual camaraderie that we all felt like we'd done such a great job, you know, so. Yeah. Anyway. Wonderful, wonderful. So can you tell us about Unity of Lexington? So tell us about the, the next part of your journey. Because I remember, Reverend Carol, you during a talk one time, so it was back in the aughts, it was a long time ago, and you said, when I was in minister in Fort Wayne, I had a dream that one day I was going to head a church in Lexington. And so I brought this up to you when you were hiring with us and, and, and going to Lexington. I said, do you remember when you said it? I don't, that's so weird. I'm like, I don't have any memory of it. It's awful. I'm embarrassed. Because no, it happens all of us. It's just the strangest thing why I don't have a memory of it, but I don't. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, um, I have a history with Unity of Lexington that goes back to when I was in ministerial school. And they offered me, my, I guess it was my second year, because I had come back here to get speak. We used to get to go to get speak when we were in school so that we could start candidating for where we would go, you know, when we graduated and were ordained. So everybody was candidating for churches, the open churches. That, and so Lexington was open at the time. Their minister had died of cancer. So I came down here and spoke and um, I went back and they called me my second year and said, we would like you to come and be our minister. And I really wanted to come. I really did because my kids were already living here at the time. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, I told him I'd let him know. Well, the next thing you know, I get an invitation to go speak at um, Fort Wayne. So I had spoken at Lexington here on a Sunday. So I took time and, and, and went to uh, Fort Wayne to speak. And so I asked God, I said, you know, I don't know what to do. I really like it at Fort Wayne. Um, actually, I hadn't gone yet. Excuse me. Uh, I was getting ready to go. So I said, God, you know, what am I going to do? Where do you want me to serve? I, you, you just got to show me something here. Give me a hint, something. So I'm on the plane and I decide, well, I'm going to do, you know, Gideon in the Bible. I don't remember the story of Gideon. <laughs> Gideon's the one that laid the fleece down twice to see if God was with him or not. So he said, I'm going to lay this fleece, fleece down the first time he did. And then, and then the second time, and I don't know, I'm, I'm no biblical scholar, but anyway, it was part of his uh, test to see if God was with him or not with him and to give him a sign in other words. And so he had laid this fleece down, they call it twice. And I'm probably murdering this story, but I <laughs> Your know, script, yeah, old Bible's not my forte. So anyway, I told God, I said, I'm going to do the Gideon thing and I'm going to ask for a sign. I really am going to ask for a sign. Um, and I'm going to make it so specific, God, that you, I, that I can't mistake it of where I'm supposed to serve. And I said, okay, God, Lexington has asked me, I really want to go, but I'll go up to Fort Wayne. I'm committed to speak because I told him I would, but you're going to have to give me somebody's going to have to send me a dozen red roses when I get home so that I'll know where to go. So I made it really, uh, and I said, and make them red. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I got finished. I went, you know, it was, it was grueling to try out for churches back then. I'm, it still is really. You go and like on Friday night, you meet and have dinner with the board. Then on Saturday, you do an all day workshop. Then on Sunday, you give a talk. And on Sunday afternoon, you answer questions for the congregation. And by the time you get done, you're wiped out. So on Sunday afternoon, after I finished with Fort Wayne, we all went downstairs to eat lunch. I was exhausted. And this woman literally came running to me with an armload of red roses. <laughs> an armload. I said, I looked up upward and I said, really, God, an armload? <laughs> I only wanted a dozen. <laughs> uh, so that was like an exclamation point. 
that wow. was when I knew I was supposed to go there. You know, I'm just like, I don't know, Suzanne, this is how I've lived my whole life. And but isn't it just glorious to live that way instead of ooh, twisting yeah. our hands? What you think? Because I've, I've done that. I've done that for a long time. I'm, well, I'm finally yeah. anchoring in, 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 into, into the other way of living, which is what you're talking about. But it took a long time. And, yeah. and you and Reverend Val, yeah. the, the way you live, the faith that you have, how you express in the world has been an, a model and inspiration for me. Oh, thank so, you. So um, I'm probably very different from even when 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 you were uh, with us because you know we're all still growing. Yeah. So um, that's beautiful. I didn't know that story. I love it. <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, so you know how you you we unity people we love our books we love our books. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, can you tell us, and I think you already did, but you can add a few others. You talked about the Catherine Ponder book being seminal for you. Um, what are some of your most influential spiritual books? Oh, definitely Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukov. I would say I that without that. hesitation. I've underlined, turned down the pages, uh, highlighted. I mean, it's just, um, yeah. What is it about it that strikes you? Uh, well, you know, I know the history of how he wrote it. He was a Navy SEAL. He came back from the war and he was so angry. And he, he just said to God, I, I can't live my life this angry. I've got, so he went out and did a vision quest in the desert. And that book was the result. So he's written some other books, but they don't have the impact on me that that one does and always will. I still refer to it. I mean, with chapters called Intention, um oh my gosh you know just I I'm trying to think of some other chapters those are obviously my those are my two favorite chapters but um yeah that without a doubt that so dynamic laws of prosperity and seed of the soul um I think if there's any other one that has really been as impactful I I was really such a big fan of Wayne Dyer's I still am um and I read every book that man wrote and I thought he was just phenomenal. And I know he's doing work, excuse me, on the other side. I know he is. Um, so anything that Wayne has written, I would say, read that, you know. Um, there's been some other people along the way, but not anybody that's had the effect on me that Catherine Ponder and Gary Zukov have had. Uh, and then, of course, I don't want to leave out the Unity books. Oh, my gosh. And so those were all the books that came before Gary Zukov and before, uh, you know, um, well, not before Catherine Ponder, but I would say Catherine Ponder first, then all the Unity books, then Gary Zukov. And any Unity book written by Charles or Myrtle's Healing Letters. Oh, my gosh. Yes, absolutely. Myrtle's Healing Letters. Yeah, they, it's a compilation of answers that she gave people that the letters that they wrote are not recorded, sadly, but you can guess from the infer inference when you read the reply, what they were asking. Um, and she tells it like it is. She is a spiritual warrior. She doesn't believe in coddling people. And I'm right there with her. It doesn't help anyone to coddle them. Um, you've got to be open and direct and really you know, speak your truth. I mean, as long as it's truth with a capital T, but, you know, she doesn't believe in, um, I don't know how you'd, you'd almost have to read it. She tells you how she feels about that sort of thing. I mean, she had a woman writing her that people at the church were talking about her and not her, but about the person who wrote, they were talking about the, the author of the letter and the author said, you know, what am I going to do? And, and I mean, she very directly said, you sh that's not your business. It shouldn't be your business. Your business should be God and your work that you're doing for God. I mean, she's very, very direct. And I loved that about her. I did. Yeah. So healing letters without a doubt. Read that. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, who were some of your biggest influences and why? Well, of course, Sister Clarice was the first one and she was my sponsoring nun. And by that, I mean, if I had gone on to take my vows, uh, my permanent vows, she would have cut my hair and she, in a ritual that they ha had back then. I don't think they do it anymore, 
but and then they dress and then they dress you they they literally dress you in the habit and so she was supposed to be the person that was to do that for me um sadly when i left she never spoke to me again um yeah it was very sad but i never stopped i never stopped loving her because the love i had for her was bigger than my personality and her personality it was bigger than that. And she she was the person who set me on that path of becoming a, a really deeply spiritual person at a very young age. And I'm grateful to her for that. Yeah. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. That is so beautiful. It was hard. I mean, I, I you know, I uh, shed a lot of tears over it, but I understand it. I mean, it takes, takes you to be 81 years old, which I am, to be able to understand something like that. So... Um, yeah and then sometimes people come in there are those who come into our lives for a window of time and perhaps it's not meant to be any longer yes. in that window exactly we miss them we miss them because we had such a connection and then there are other relationships that will endure the whole lifetime absolutely right? there's never a poem know why there. there's a poem out there about that and i really believe it i think it's so true but one thing that Myrtle Filmer always emphasizes in her book, Healing Letters, there's a difference between the personality and the individuality, which is your spirit that's connected to God. Some people say soul, and we won't get into the, you know, unity teaching about that because it's a little tricky. But um, she says, when you deal with personalities, you can never be satisfied. She said, it's only when we deal with one another on the Christed level that we can be satisfied. And she's so right on. She's so right on. Right. And I may disappoint you. And, and she says this in one of her letters. I may disappoint you if you spent more time with me. You may disappoint me. That's the way it is. But on the Christed level, it's so much deeper and so much more lasting. So that's why I love her because she had that depth of wisdom, you know, that, of course, we all have divine wisdom within us, every one of us, but she really had it developed it to a great extent. And I love that about her. Yeah. Mm. I think it's why she was successful in founding the unity movement, you know? Right. It, um, because if there weren't, wis if there hadn't been wisdom there, it wouldn't have endured. It would have been more of a flash in the pan, I think. Right. Right. Exactly. Right, but there's there's something there that's still drawing people. To I that. agree. I agree. Oh, uh, she she said that they didn't have a corner on the truth, and I'm paraphrasing, but she said, you know, we haven't invented anything new. She said this truth of the Christ has been around for you know eons and eons. We've just you know discovered a new way to go about it, and so that's what I loved about them, you know, for her and her husband Charles. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been wonderful. I could just talk with you for hours. <laughs> you know? I have their picture oh. in my desk, Charles oh. and Myrtle. Oh, I love that. Well, let me tell you the part I really love about it. On the back, it says, I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm as I spring forth with a mighty faith to do what ought to be done by me. And he was age 91 when he wrote that. And I'm right there with him. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, he was spry. He, he definitely had a handle on his mind about aging. He, he knew, he he knew how, he, how he wanted to perceive that. Absolutely. And he didn't want any unnecessary blocks no. to slow him down. Oh. Mental blocks. Yeah. I don't know quite as much about him. I mean, there is an it's kind of odd, but I don't think there's quite as much written about him. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But anyway, I always latched on to what was written about her for some strange reason. You know, she just kind of because we had so much in common with birthdays and dresses and, and the name Caroline and <laughs> all that stuff. Right. And, and um, for uh, for people who are uh, in unity will know this. But for anyone who is listening to this because you're exploring unity, Myrtle had been very ill. Do you want to yes. go into that a little bit about how, how ill she was and, and how she ended up healing that? Yeah, I sure can. Um, she and Charles <clears throat> were studying unity principles. They were studying the Christ principles, I should say. 
because they really hadn't gotten into founding the unity movement just yet. But anyway, they were studying the Christ principles and they were traveling. They went up to they went up to Chicago and heard somebody speak. And the speaker said an affirmation that she never forgot. I am a child of God and I, therefore I do not inherit sickness. Yeah, I think that was E.B. Weeks, wasn't it? Yes, I'm sorry. That's who it was. And so they came back home and she she had tuberculosis. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that tuberculosis doesn't just affect the lungs. It gets into your bones, into your intestines and your organs. She had it all over. And the doctor said, you need to go home, you know, make your plans to die. And she went home to rest and all of that. But it came to her. She had this divine idea that if she's she went outside and she was outside by a brook and the brook was a running brook and she looked down and saw these living plants and things and she 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 knew that they had the divine intelligence of god within them and she and she basically said if these plants and these living things growing out of the ground and i'm paraphrasing have the divine intelligence of god in them then i do too so she came home and she started saying that affirmation that E.B. Weeks had taught her. And she's, then she started speaking to every um, cell in her body, every, um, what do you call it, system in her body. And she, she would take a picture of Jesus and put it in a chair across from her. And she would spend hours talking to him, praying to him, with him. I mean, because we don't really believe that. I don't know. I shouldn't get into that. Okay. But Jesus was, you know, her inspiration. So she, they were, they were talking, they were communicating. Almost like peers. Yeah. Yeah. It like that. I mean, not really because she was learning from Jesus, but on this, on, anyway, I guess maybe I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent here but she would apologize to the systems in her body. She would say to her lungs, I'm sorry that I ever saw you as less than whole and perfect. I'm sorry I ever called you anything other than beautiful and whole and perfect and strong. You are strong. You know, she would just talk to them and even include apologies to them. And in two years, she had cured herself of incurable, in her case, tuberculosis. Wow. That's it. Wow. Yeah. Well, and she had been told as a child, oh, you, 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 we have inherent weakness in our lungs in this family. Yes. So she was told that exactly. over and over and over again. Right. So when you're saying, she said, I'm sorry if yes. I ever called you weak, she was referring to all of that programming that she bought into. Yes. She was speaking to each organ and system in her body and all of that. It was, you know, and the thing was then after that was when she, when she got her own healing that she started down on uh, Tracy Street in Kansas City, Missouri, which my car used to be parked across the street when I worked down there. <clears throat> and she started having what they called silent unity. And you can look this up online. It's really wonderful. I looked it all up online one day and all these people who were in this silent unity were waving at the camera. I just burst out into tears. I felt such a connection to all of them. They would... <clears throat> It, no matter where they were at, I think it was nine o'clock at night, they would pray together. And there were also people coming into her office and having her pray with them. And all these healings started taking place. Just all of these, I guess, hundreds of them. I don't know. Just many, many, many healings. And that's how the unity movement started. Yeah. Mm. It was called the Little Society of Silent Help. It's now called Silent Unity. <laughs> and do you want to tell our listeners, because that is one of my favorite stories in Unity, about the establishment of Silent Unity and how oh. it's been there for sit through two world wars and yeah. about, about how, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell what I know and you can correct me if sure, I'm wrong. Sure, sure. But that, um, th so they started this chapel so that there could be someone praying in this chapel over any prayers that were sent in 24 hours a day. Someone's in there praying over them. People would rotate out yes. and then your prayer would be in there for a certain amount of time. I think now it's 30 days. And so it is it, in that chapel, this has been going on so long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, went through the two world wars and now on into today. And oh. Well, you know, I mean, this is this is an experiential story. I'll tell you that when I went out to interview to go to ministerial school, um, I was driving and I'd never been out to Kansas City and I came up over the hill and um, I'm trying to think of the name of that city. I can't think of it right now, but it blew something. Anyway, I came up over a rise on the interstate and I saw the tower. Mm. I saw the Unity Tower and oh, tears just started streaming. <laughs> and when I got there and I got out of my car, put my feet on the ground, I just had electricity run completely up through my legs, up through my body. It was just so phenomenal. So that energy that she and Charles brought to that place is still there. It's still there. And so when I went into, we got to go into silent unity and I had the same electrical sort of experience when I went in there because it's in the round and these drawers are all in the round walls and they're changed out according to the date, you know. And new prayers are brought in. The old prayers, of course, after 30 days are discarded. But it's pretty phenomenal. There's always been somebody praying. You're right, 24-7 for a very, very long time. Yeah. And when I have sent prayers for, to Silent Unity for people, remarkable things have happened. Oh, they have. Me too. Uh, Me I too. mean, just remarkable things. It's And I have people not connected to Unity. Hey, will you put my relative in, in there? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, so it's it, it reaches beyond just us yeah well when I was at Unity of East Louisville I always made sure that whoever we were praying for as chaplains and all that that got sent out to Silent Unity every month right. and I and I love that and and so now what I do I don't send them to Silent Unity any longer but I have Silent Unity pray for my church Unity of Lexington every month and um, just through my own, you know, writing in and saying, please keep my congregation in your prayers. But we do pray with one another every Sunday online. So it's really important. Yeah. And we follow the uh, Silent Unity format. We only use first names. We don't mention what the malady is. We just say, please see them whole and well, or please see, you know, that's what we do. You're so. bypassing the problem level and going straight to the um, healing level. Absolutely. Or you if you say, or if you I'll say tell you what, girl, you got it. You got finally it. Finally, after 20 years. After 20 years yeah. Well, I, I have met people after 20 years, don't got it. <laughs> you got it. Well, I think it's even bypassing the healing level because if you're seeing someone already as whole, yeah, that's different from even saying you're broken and need to be healed. Um, and, you know, the outcome may not always be be that someone heals in the way that we want them to the physical body but i think often there is some kind of healing yeah um well i know, think it, it's hard for us to see that the entire picture that god sees you know we right. it was like looking through a knot hole with what we see i think sometimes or a good part of the time yeah it is it is it can be a challenge but you know that to me was the key to Jesus being able to heal the way that he did because he never saw the person as less than whole and perfect. And he saw that perfect pattern of wholeness in everybody that came to him for healing. Um, I just think, you know, I, I think I was telling somebody the other day about the water at Lourdes. Mm. So everybody thinks the water was is what's doing the healing but there are people that go there and get into that water who are not healed and so it's the consciousness of the person who's getting into the water that's what it's all about so jesus consciousness was so high and you know he looked at them as whole and perfect and without blemish and he never saw sickness he never saw illness he never saw disease it was like that was how he was able to do it so yeah, makes sense. And I like how he prayed. And I can see where unity's, um, pr the way we format our prayers are inspired by him. When you think about the Lord's prayer, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. They're, they're statements. 
their acknowledgments of what he knows. It's not necessarily saying, please give us this or this, that. Give right. us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Forgive us, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's affirmative prayer. If you read Fenton's, F-E-N-T-O-N apostrophe S translation, uh, that is where you learn that, that the Lord's Prayer started out in the Aramaic to be affirmative statements. It somehow got translated in the King James Version to be begging. But it, it never... doesn't sound like it's begging to me. Oh, it sounds it sounds very affirmative because he's saying to me, I mean, we all have different perceptions. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Well, like that's true. they sound like statements. That's to me. true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true. Now that you think uh, now that you mention it, I'll have to think on that. <laughs> well, you know, I got backtracked about unity of Lexington. What I was telling you was um I had to call and tell Unity of Lexington back when I was ordained that I wasn't coming, and it was really difficult. Uh, I would have had to take a part-time job with my first church, and that also mm -hmm. bothered me, you know, because they didn't have a big enough church. But I always kept my bond with them, and there's a handful of people down here that I've known ever since I was ordained and before when I came to speak there, and uh, I've always kept in touch with them. Um, so, you know, I've got a 20 year, more than a 20 year bond with some of the people down here. But, um, the reason I came here, of course, was because of my children. Yes. So, and my grandchildren, and I, I made that clear, but, um, I don't know. It just really bothered me, Suzanne, when I got down here and there wasn't a unity church. And I'm like, I felt lost. I was in a new city. I'd left all my friends. I'd left my church behind. <laughs> And I was, I did have my family, but I was feeling kind of lost without a unity church. I wanted a unity family, you know, so I just said to myself, I can't live like this. So I started um, teaching classes and that helped. And so then they started saying to me, like the exact same thing they said to me when I was teaching classes up in Louisville before I founded Unity of uh, East Louisville all the people in my classes were saying, you need your own church, you need your own church. And that's what happened here when I came here and was teaching classes. So that seems to be the catalyst to get things going, unity classes, so. And then, you know, when you said that, I thought about, that's what happened in Charles, to Charles and Myrtle too. They were just teaching. Yes, general, They exactly. were praying with people. And then people were like, we, we want a church, we want a church. And they're like, well, we don't want to start a church. You know, that's not really what we have in mind. But then they did it because they were, they, people wanted that. But that yeah. wasn't, they weren't setting out to do that. No, and you're so right. You're so right. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, I, my hat's off to you for how much study you've done. It shows. Okay. It absolutely shows. The way you live your life and the things you've shared with me tonight, I, um, I'm honored to share the path with you. Thank so. you. Mm, I miss you. <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> well, you know, it was really hard for me because Unity Worldwide Ministries made it really clear to me that I could not come back once I left. I and think that that's common in other denominations yes, too, where yes. there's, a, there's a window period. Yes. Because yes. they want the new minister to get established. And, and, exactly. You know, and, yeah. and I, and I got it. I mean, I did get it. It was hard for me, but I okay. did get it. I really did. So it, it was really hard, but it's okay. It's all. in. so anyway, then I, I just decided down here, I just have a service and see what happened. And I had 62 people at my first service. I, yeah. That's the one that I came to. I think I came to your first service. I think you did. Yeah. <laughs> of yeah, course, half of them were my family, but <laughs> still 62 for a, a, a launch is good. It was very, very good. Now, I don't know what's going to happen now because COVID just wiped us out and then we lost our place to meet. And uh, so that all this has been going on over two years. We're going to have our first in-person service in over two years on the 18th of this month. So please say prayers. So okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's good. That's a milestone. That's definitely a milestone. Yeah. Yeah. But, COVID's um, been hard on, on, on the churches for sure. Yeah, all the churches. I mean, it has changed church a lot. I'm not quite sure if things are ever going to go back to the way they were. Maybe that's a good thing. I mean, we might see as time goes on, you know. So. What I'm kind of seeing is that people are wanting to gather in small groups, not necessarily church services, 
yeah there will always be people who do i'll always be one of those people yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a creature of sunday morning a creature of the church potluck the church basement yes yeah. me too so, I love so, the fellowship, um, you know. But it's changing, and I, I see a lot of small group activity, and and that's good. There's goodness in that too. Absolutely, there is. I mean, of course, you can have what we used to have when we started that God's Promise program. You can have sacred circles, uh, and and that's a good thing. That's a really good thing to have small groups in your ministry. It really is. It it, it can never hurt anything. Um, but um, I, for myself. I liked having somebody on Sunday whom I knew had more experience than I did, had more education in it than I did, had more time into it than I did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That because that's I mean, I started out with Mary Omwake and she had the church in Overland Park, Kansas, and I got every CD that woman ever produced. She's <laughs> got her angel wings now. She ended up in uh, Hawaii, but in Maui, but before she died but I mean that's what I needed to feed me I needed I needed somebody who knew more than I did yeah I mean it's okay I think to get up and share stories with people but that only take you so far really I mean in my estimate for me it only took me it would only take me so far I had to have somebody who really was more more I mean, I like those kind of people who know more than I do. And I like to pick their brain about it. You know, <laughs> You know, I agree because you know, I was a, kind of a late bloomer. And so you were that for me. Oh, and, good. Um, great. And, and yeah, I needed that. Like that's, that, that's, that's what I needed. And, and there are okay. always people. And now yeah. sometimes people are looking to me. You know, I'm 52 now. And, and I'm I like, what? Oh, I I can see. what? You want yeah. to <laughs> I can see why. I mean, I'm finding this out tonight. I mean, I can see why. Yes, it's good. It's a good thing. Great. It's great. Yeah. Oh, I think we have covered everything. What do you think? I think we did. I think we did. Thank you so much for doing this. This is this going to be lovely. This, um, is, this was really fun for me. And it was good. real reminiscent for me. And it's got me charged because I'm thinking about how we started the church and, mm -hmm. you know, all the things that went on with God's promise and all the fun and everything. And I just, I don't know, you know, I, I'm going to always probably always be doing church. Suzanne. <laughs> and I if know. I'm a hundred, they may be wheeling yeah. me in, but I'll still be doing it. <laughs> I, I hear you. There's something magical about that 11 o'clock hour. I sit there sometimes in my seat and think about all the people around the country around the world that are at that very moment yes. are in prayer. And, and I don't care what their religion is or, wow. or you know, if it's the same as ours, they're in yeah. prayer. And I feel in fellowship with them. All right. Well, yeah, oh, that's a good way to look at it. I, I think about that in terms of Christmas time, all the different religions, what they're doing in the, or Easter time and what they're doing in the way of pilgrimages and things like that. We're all doing together. But you're right. The hour, that 11 o'clock hour is pretty popular. And you're right. And yeah. it, it, it's a, a weekly meeting. And, and yeah, that's the way I see it. And, and I'll, I'll always be for it. Yeah. Well, I, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, me too. I'm sorry that my video wasn't working. And hopefully we got we have some good audio quality here. And yeah. I'll let you know when we get it up. You might be able to... Um, you think you could add it later? If somebody really kind of knows what they're doing and I don't digitally, you might be able to Sonny's add. going to help me. So we'll add your picture anyway, you know. Yeah, something. Or the, or the logo for the church or something. It might be a still picture, but you could add yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you take care and congratulations on starting up again in person. Well, thank you. I'm a little anxious about it, but it's okay. I'm uh, but I'm having a lot of fun ordering the Christmas cookies and getting people mm. to greet and people to help me set up chairs and <laughs> yeah. all the things I used to do when I was up there, you know. Yes, and, yes. Well, actually, all the things we were renting from uh, Montessori school. Yes. And then they decided that they were going to use that community space and make classrooms out of it. Um, and so they said we couldn't come back anymore because they were in the middle of construction. But then something happened. Did you see that light blinking? Yes. <laughs> I don't know why it's doing that. It does that every now and then. So you can see it in the reef. <laughs> it looks like the reef is 
thinking. <laughs> it's my ring light. And maybe if I don't move, it won't do it. But anyway, um, they they decided not to rent to us anymore. And it was a blow. And I've looked for two years and haven't been able to find any place. So we're just going to meet once a month at this clubhouse where my daughter lives. And, um, you know, it's it's a really nice place and we're just going to do it once a month and maybe I can attract enough people. Somebody can find a place for us. That's what I'm praying and hoping. Yeah. Well, I know I'm that, affirmation that works. I'm getting ready to, you know what? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I need to look that affirmation. I mean, I need to put that affirmation in our bulletins on the 18th and we'll start saying that right then that day. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I, I've already got it in the bullet, not the bulletin, but the order of service I've got taped up here on the, light and by golly we're going to start saying it this sunday so i think you're going to get it thank you yes i do i'm trying not to lose heart but it's disappointing yeah so okay kiddo all right you take care lots of love to you i love bless and appreciate you and to everybody at unity of east louisville i miss you guys Uh, (laughs) take care all righty bye-bye bye-bye Thank you.